Ukrainian story, a challenge to international media, and those who have not done it yet, I, I'm, I'm sorry that I say that, but I must, because I, not because I was asked, but because it's a good thing. Don't forget to pre-order your last book, The Longest Travel, Naidov Shapodrash. Thank you very much, Srihi, for this wonderful introduction. Uh, can I be here? No, I can't. Uh, mm -hmm, I'm doing something very wrong. Uh, AI. Okay. 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 Which one? Both. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for this very encouraging uh, introduction. Uh, I'm really very happy to be here. It's uh, a great privilege to welcome wholeheartedly uh, Lviv uh, Media Forum. I wish you all uh, very fruitful uh, work uh, and very successful gathering. Uh, it's really very important uh, what you are going to be busy with here for those uh, three days. Uh, and, uh, and I really feel privileged um, and uh, thankful uh, for that invitation. Uh, it's a great opportunity to be able to share with you part of my, uh, I would say, uh, personal experience of a writer who um, since 15 months has been on a narrative war and actually has been on a narrative war uh, since long before the very term has been coined. Uh, and the issue raised already here, the issue uh, looming in the air, this shift in the discourse covering this war, uh, and uh, the shift in a narration about Ukraine, uh, the shift in a Ukrainian story, or rather how Ukraine is being heard, uh, started being heard during uh, this year. That's exactly the issue I'm planning to focus uh, on here within uh, the next uh, 30, 30 years, oh, 25 already minutes. Um, I'm horrible at timing. Uh, but, uh, well, that's my weak spot and has always been, uh, well, those who, those who read me know that Zabushko, that I'm notorious with the Zabushko sentences, uh, which take from two to three pages, averagely. Mm, uh, so, um, well, I, it's not only that I write this way, I also speak and think this way. So introducing a full stop is, is my personal problem, but I do promise uh, that I'll save uh, in the end uh, 10 or 15 minutes for an open mic and we'll be able to have a discussion. Um, well, so, uh, speaking of being Ukraine being heard, uh, I guess uh, I can use uh, a kind of a quest and start uh, with the quotation uh, if someone will recognize if someone recognizes it uh, well uh, please uh, don't tell anybody uh, but if there are guesses 
in the audience um, when this quotation appeared in the Western media, might have appeared in the Western media. Well, you are welcome to guess. Within the past few months, Ukraine, a nation unknown to the West, has come into the forefront of the world's attention. Most people, I think, are prepared to say that they know little or nothing about it. For this deficiency in knowledge, they need not blame themselves. There are good reasons for it. The suppressors of Ukraine took care that she be unknown. They indeed denied that she even existed. It would be difficult to imagine anything more reprehensible than this silencing of a nation which, by ancient right, belongs to the European family of nations. But uncontrollable events have now brought Ukraine into the international arena. End of quotation. Any guesses? When, where, and when? Okay, um, I'll tell you. These words belong to British journalist Lancelot Lawton, who during the 30s, with the smog of totalitarianism sickening over Europe, was trying to open the eyes of the British public to the importance of the Ukrainian question in the forthcoming and unavoidable, as he wisely foresaw, battles in Eastern Europe. He even delivered a special address on the subject in the House of Commons in 1939, and the quotation comes from that address by him. Um, nevertheless, Lowton's message passed then unheard. The West completely missed his Ukrainian lesson and crossed Ukraine off its list for many decades. Nor did the reappearance of uh, our country on the political map in 1991 help to make it more recognizable. There was simply no room for Ukrainian story in the Western narrative as long as the Russian story was going unrevised. Ukraine did exist in the Western media, but on the periphery of the Western, which stands for world imagination. Uh, until February 24, 2022, it was, uh, it was perceived as a black suburb of Great Russia, or even, another quotation, Russia's legitimate backyard, the expression which, although half-jokingly, was used during the uh, discussion held as recently as last January, January 22, by a British media whose name I think I'm going to mercifully skip here because, I mean, it does not really matter. Nomina sunt odiosa. Um, um, well, the reason I was following uh, was that I was invited 
to join the exciting discussion they were having uh, of two British intellectuals on how to groom Ukrainian constitution to please Putin better, to pacify Putin. And the editor of this respectful media who sent me an invitation to join the discussion was obviously completely unaware of how arrogantly imperialistic this might sound to my ear. Of course, I refused, but I remember this, uh, this, this term, Russia's legitimate backyard. The term that was in usage back in the 30s in another part of Europe, T word other countries and territories. Well, but the fact that the term is still here proves that we really have as a civilization, as a civilization, we are having very serious problems with history lessons from the 20th century. Lots of things have changed, of course. We, in the meantime, that is, since Ukraine and its army has ruined all the stereotypes about great Russia and its second army in the invincible second army in the world, uh, and uh, small Ukraine, Russia's legitimate backyard. Uh, and yes, uh, military victories, uh, unfortunately, continue playing a decisive role in the narrative wars, were it not for the uh, victories, unexpected victories of the Ukrainian army in the battle for Kiev and further on, uh, well, um, we would have been remaining unheard until now. Uh, yet, even now, um, even now, uh, here I'm very much tempted to attract your attention, or rather to, to recommend, uh, well, with all my readers, Azil, um, the column um, uh, published uh, last month by uh, Neil Abrams from Berkeley University um, entitled Dear Illustrious Professors of International Relations Stop Point to Period Talking Period About Period Ukraine. It's an absolutely gorgeous uh, piece of uh, political journalism uh, and a good, also a good sample of an appropriate style applied in appropriate circumstances. Uh, he addresses um, the those illustrious known uh, Western, mostly American, experts in international relations who, um, uh, who suggest um, the Land for Peace Treaty as, a, uh, as an ideal peaceful solution to stop the war without no expertise on Ukraine ever, without taking into consideration, uh, well, anything that Ukrainians might have to say on the subject. Uh, and uh, he does uh, very brief and very witty and caustic, I would say, a review of half a dozen of such publications belonging to authored by big names like Mirschmeier, uh, Levin, and others. Um, 
uh, and uh, addresses them. Uh, like if you if you feel itchy, if you really feel compelled to contribute an article on the issue of Russian-Ukrainian war, then please close your laptop, go outside, take a walk, adopt a dog. Uh, go volunteer on a food market, uh, well, anything you might do will be more useful than that, so get over yourselves for Christ's sake. Uh, the question remaining unanswered, though, also unanswered by Neil Abrams, uh, is where do all those illustrious professors, and there are more uh, of them than he listed in his column, uh, where do they get the temerity to imply that they know better than the Ukrainians uh, what solution will be uh, ideal in the circumstances? And this is um, exactly because the only answer you can have to this question, uh, well, given you don't doubt, uh, well, I would, I would say that, uh, that they really believe what they write. Um, the only answer is that for them, Ukraine, still does not possess a voice of her own. Ukraine still is still seen as the, to use Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak's terms, the subaltern who cannot speak. After 15 years of war, 15 months, sorry, of war, after 15 months of victorious war, uh, that on our side that proved the success of the 30 years of Ukraine's independence in state building, army in building, and civil society building, still. Still, we remain in their eyes in the position of the silent subaltern who cannot speak for herself and for whom they know better. Uh, why? And here we come, here I am going to make this. Um, here I'm going to make this uh, point, which I think is um, really crucial um, in the narrative uh, war, uh, and which unfortunately still remains largely underestimated both by media people, uh, by uh, politicians, by decision makers, unfortunately, even by intellectuals. Um, a country does not get known by, being, by becoming newsworthy. The only way for a country to get really heard as a subject of her own history is getting known culturally. Yes. Yes, that's been the point, yes. Thanks for stressing it. And I can give you some proofs for that. Uh, 
not that Ukraine was not was lacking the attention of the world media before. In fact, the February of Russia's full-scale invasion was the third time in this century, I'm not speaking of the 90s, let alone 1991, let alone 1990, our first Maidan, which was totally missed uh, by the world media, totally unknown outside Ukraine. Um, but in this century, last February was the third time that Ukraine was staying in the top news of all the world media. Uh, the first time was, of course, the Orange Revolution, 2004, and that was what we were seeing as the turning point that uh, the West, all of a sudden and quite unexpectedly, discovered that, uh, to quote the title of President Kuchma's book, Ukraine is not Russia. Uh, that, yes, we are having a civil society. Yes, so we have a society, civil society which is capable to fight for democracy. Yes, we, we were fighting uh, for the fair election and we have won. And it was a great story. We were, Ukraine was the darling, had been the darling of all the world media for about half a year. That's long enough. Mm, uh, this uh, orange Woodstock of Ukraine uh, had been the story, the top story all over the world from uh, the from the Pacific on both sides of the Atlantic uh, um, well and then what then the discourse shifts uh, well, Maidan gradually translates uh, you know into some uh, I would say, petty squabbles among uh, the local politicians, of course, all of them corrupted, uh, then, then the audience loses interest and stops following. But in the meantime, the big shift of the attention uh, takes place. Uh, for there, again, there come the experts with the issue uh, that sounds really important. Hey, look, if Ukrainians could make it, then the Russians someday will be able to make it too. Hey, Maidan in Russia is somewhere around the corner. There is no actually, uh, you know, any, any visible threats of Russia sliding into the dictatorship because in Kiev there was Maidan and they have won. Literally. It appeared that with our victory, you know, we served to cover uh, this swelling Russian fascist dictatorship because, well, because we are the cousin nations. We are almost the same. Because we are still, you know, some kind of younger brother and there is no su really such a big difference. Okay, the difference in political culture uh, does not make, it, does, it just proves that this part of the former Soviet Union, the term still in usage, the former Soviet Republic, until February 2022, we were the former Soviet Republic, and within this year of my longest journey, so to speak, or the longest book tour, so to speak, uh, well, and it was, it was really, you know, quite a road movie for me, you know, this 15 months, uh, uh, somewhere in, in December, when I 
turned the location on my telephone, uh, Google happily uh, wrote, congratulations, Oksana, you have visited 21 countries and 93 cities this year. Uh, so that was the moment, you know, when I started to scream back to the artificial intellect, you idiot who told you I wanted to. Um, well, but, uh, but this is a kind of an experience, you know, which, um, which gives you, I would say, some sociological material for an observation, and, and there are still the countries, the further westwards, the more of them, that were using this term, the former Soviet Republic. Until uh, in Germany, I finally, um, you know, had enough and said, I'm sorry, but do you always say Germany, the former Third Reich? It is, it is pretty much the same, yeah, it is part of your political history. Yes, okay, being the Soviet Republic, well, it, it is part of my country's political history, but there were other episodes in this history before, no matter what President Putin tells you. And these episodes uh, actually shaped our political culture no less uh, than the 70 years of being the Soviet Republic. So, uh, okay, uh, that, that works. So, uh, former Soviet Republic, okay, if this, form, this former Soviet Republic was taken as something, well, more politically advanced, and the shift of interest went again, you know, north way. North way to Moscow, because prior to uh, 2004, uh, it was then in Moscow that all the correspondents covering the events in the former Soviet Union were located. Uh, the Orange Revolution was the first time that they came to, to Kiev to, to, to make the first hand report and discovered that we are having electricity and the running water. And, uh, and yes, that Kiev is actually a big European looking city with nice restaurants, cafes, and, uh, and well, lots of uh, historical sites and so on and so forth. Uh, well, but but there still was no uh, shift in the interest to Ukraine's own history. The only writer, um, the only Ukrainian writer who hid the international stage after the Orange, Revol Orange Revolution was, uh, just please don't laugh, uh, Marina Levitsky. If you don't remember who it is, uh, it's a British author who published the short history of tractors in Ukrainian. Yes, this book, this book has been for over a year the only, one and only book on Ukraine available in English, which an interested EU citizen could buy or order in a bookstore to learn something about this country which had an orange revolution. The, okay, the situation was gradually changing, so by 2014, when there came the second act of this big drama and for the second time in this century, Ukraine became visible Please note, I'm not saying heard, I'm saying visible. So by 2014, Ukraine already boasted, I would say, a decent set of uh, internationally representative contemporary writers, which any independent country boasts. Even Albania has Ismail Kadare, doesn't matter that he lives in Paris, but anyone you know who wants to know something about Alba Albania, 
well, goes and reads Ismail Kadare. So by 2014, there were Kurkov, uh, Jadan, uh, Zabushko, I'm sorry, well, Andruhovich in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so, well, enough is enough, yeah? Enough is enough. We, we know, uh, you know, whom to call uh, when we need a comment uh, about anything Ukrainian. Uh, and we, we have these writers who are, well, who may be not, you know, the, uh, the top best-selling authors uh, in the European book markets, but at least, okay, there are some voices. Uh, well, there are, it is a very dubious position, I have to say, as an insider, uh, because still the contexts, the cultural contexts of your work, remain invisible for the uh, foreign public and uh, therefore more than once just misinterpreted. Uh, and I remember it was like a hit in the face when I was reading a very complimentary review of an uh, American critic um, for my uh, novel, The Museum of Abandoned Secrets, when it appeared in English. Uh, the review was very enthusiastic and everything, and then there was this uh, punchline that all this is, um, all, the, uh, this, all this is especially impressive because as far as my mind was concerned, it came out of nowhere. So, we are, like, so, so to say, speakers. Ukraine got its speakers, well, in literature, in music, but, but we are out of nowhere. We are not representatives of the, we are not perceived, we were not perceived as the representatives of a millennium old cultural tradition, our literally, literary cultural mothers or forefathers were remaining uh, unknown. And interestingly, you know, it's, uh, well, uh, out of nowhere. Why out of nowhere? Because, uh, well, in, in the mind of an American critic, uh, well, it just, um, it goes for granted that if he, uh, well, after doing some Googling, cannot find any Ukrainian novels, any, you know, classic of Ukrainian modernism translated into English, it is not because they are not translated, it is because they don't exist. That's how it is perceived. That's how a country with no history, country with no culture, country with no tradition, country with no past, no story, uh, well, is a country with no, no history, is a country with no voice. It might have aspirations for the future, it might have a young and boasting, uh, uh, young and uh, boisterous, uh, sorry, uh, civil society, mm, but it is still subaltern who just learns how to speak about herself and therefore cannot be really taken into consideration seriously. Mr. Putin's voice will always be more resonant and if he comes to the international stage and pronounces his historical essays about Ukraine's past, well, it is taken as he is authorized to do that because his story is being known and all the departments of the Slavic studies, well, which are actually the departments of the, which were actually, have been actually until recently, until the past year, the departments of the Russian studies, in fact, only now the situation is getting changed or decolonized, as I was taught to, to say in uh, the University of Oxford. 
they say it's the most fashionable word right now in the Slavic departments all over the world, decolonization. Decolonization of the Soviet studies, okay. Uh, so all the, uh, all this Russian, or Slavic, AK a- uh, Russian departments were selling to the future politicians, to the politicians and decision makers to be the same story that Putin now sells to the world, generation after generation. So that's why in 2014, after Maidan, uh, the attention was again, she, Maidan that was welcome, like you know, any, any revolution of the civil society, any proof uh, that civil society can stand against the attempted dictatorship, uh, but still, oops, is this a strong hint? I am more or less in the middle. We, we, never, had, we never had like any doubt that uh, <laughs> it is exact, like, like that one can listen to you and learn all the new things can I have five, forever. Can I have five minutes somehow to bring it to, the, to some conclusion? Of course. Yeah? <laughs> Well, because, because we are just in 2014. Uh, I was warning you. <laughs> well, okay. I'm not aware. I was warning the organizer at the time. I'm very disorganized spe- speaker, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, uh, so, so every time it has been the same story and even on, uh, in February 2022, uh, the next day after the invasion, there was, um, I was watching it, uh, uh, there was uh, the, um, uh, there was um, a very good conversation between Anne Applebaum, uh, I think it was, on, it was on CNN, doesn't matter, okay. Uh, so uh, it, it was entitled um, uh, An Applebaum, uh, uh, Timothy Snyder uh, to trustworthy Western scholars who really have an expertise in Ukraine. Well, and uh, Yuval Noah Harari, who in my humble opinion is more of a media figure, um, well, and uh, it was uh, the war, uh, the title was The War in Ukraine and um, the Future of the World. And the discourse was exactly the same as I remember from 2004 and 2014. Finally, finally the world is going to discover Ukraine. Ukraine has a civil society. Ukraine is, is uh, showing the resistance to the Russian aggression. And then, and then Harari making the same point. That since they are fr- cousin nations with the Russians, it might mean, you know, that this Putin's war will be stopped with the protests in Russia. Dear God. You know, February 25, you know, the person who is regarded as a respectful historian uh, also of that part of the world. So uh, it, is, it is again, you know, the situation of the, the situation which proves that as long as, yes, okay, okay, two minutes, two minutes, please. I have to make the point, hey. Uh, it was all illustrations, you know? So, so what is changing now? What, what, what is being changed uh, since uh, the full-scale invasion? And what is the work in process that is going to change the narratives and why we have to work for all that? Uh, yes, finally. For the first time, there is a really serious revision of Russian-Ukrainian relations in 
historical context. This book, uh, The Longest Journey, that you have mentioned, Serhii, um, well, you see, I am kind of, uh, you know, fishing for one more minute, referring, referring to your introduction, yeah. Uh, this book was actually ordered me by, the, uh, by my Italian publisher, I wrote it at the request of the Western publisher, the first book that I wrote at the, at the publisher's request in my, in my entire literary career. Uh, and uh, the request was, please explain us what we have missed in the cultural and historical contexts of this war. 120,000 uh, characters. I said, I'm sorry, I should start from the 17th century. Yes, we have to start back from the 17th century, and this work is already being done. Yes, for the first time in the past year, for the first time, Ukrainian, not living, but dead authors started appearing in translation in the major European languages. And yes, this was commercially successful. If you happen to be in London, by the way, please uh, don't miss uh, the presentation of Cassandra by Lesia Ukrainka in theater omnibus. I'm personally proud for that because it, before it took me 10 years of convincing all the European theater director to do Cassandra, the most topical drama uh, for, for our times. The drama all permeated with the premonition of the world war. Mm, well, and it was like, yes, okay, yes, uh, but, but it's only now due to the victory, thanks to the victories of the Ukrainian army, that Lesia Ukrainka finally made it to the London stage. Well, this is the way to get heard. This is the way to get understood, because culture works on the personal level. And if you identify yourself with the characters of this film or that book. If this music is part of your personal experience, well, then you really can understand this country, not as this troublesome subaltern from the news, from the place where something bad, or good for that matter, doesn't matter, uh, is happening, but this is the dialogue uh, when, yes, this is the real dialogue and this is a real exchange of opinions, messages, this is democracy, this is the world in which we all want to live. Okay, I can, I can sense your impatience, so I am not daring, you know, to go on. Uh, so I hope uh, I hope we have time for the for the open mic. I, I I believe that 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 was the reason why the organizers have invited a German to uh, to moderate this discussion, <laughs> because like uh, it's it's easy for me to play a blood hunt and to be a, a, a person who who is hated by the whole room of Ukrainians. <laughs> we are famous for for uh, for for the love even before we we, we didn't send the leopards. Uh, I yeah. still have some juicy pieces to share, you know, so I, I really count on the question. Yeah, but, yeah. but I'm, I'm sure we can, like, unfortunately, like, like we, we, we have started later, and we, 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 we are already, like, moved it, like, for 30 minutes into the future. So uh, I believe we could, like, to, to make this discussion really effective, I think we can make uh, the whole, like, Q&A session during the, 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 um, during the, the dinner, and... Mm, I'm really sorry, but... You are cutting me off altogether, yeah? Okay, okay I give up, yes. <laughs> it is... Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It was, was really amazing. And as, you bo as your book's like, when, when I read your book, I cannot stop. And uh, that is exactly what I feel now, because like, I, cut, I cut you from the audience saying, no, 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 now it's stopped, we come to another topic, and I see that, per that people are unhappy with that, but that is the part of, of like, being limited in time. Thank you, Oksana Zabushka, for this amazing, amazing thing.